Today's video is brought to you by Ridge. More on them in a bit. Britain is a nation known for its eccentricity and rather unique approach to life, from cheese rolling to constant apologizing. Sorry, I meant no disrespect. Eccentricity proves to be a key foundation of Britain's international image, easily on par with the royal family or Big Ben. But what you may not know, however, is that this penchant for the unconventional is not limited to daily life and cultural practices. It also permeates the realm of engineering and design, particularly in the field of military technology. So with that in mind, today we're going to embark on a journey through the annals of British armoured history and look at some of the most peculiar and the most innovative tanks that have showcased the nation's inherent eccentricity. From multi-turreted monstrosities to insect-like urban fighters, we're going to delve into the captivating stories behind these five weird British tanks that really embody the quirky spirit that has come to define this island nation. The Dog 2 was big. It was really, really big. With an incredible length of 10 meters and weighing a staggering 80 tons, it was one of the biggest tanks ever made when it left the factory in 1941. Developed during the early years of World War II, it was intended to serve as a heavily armored breakthrough tank capable of traversing the most difficult of terrain and widest trenches. Its immense size was paired up with a similarly ridiculous amount of armor, with thicknesses ranging from 114 millimeters at the front to 76 millimeters on the side and rear. It was armed with a 76.2mm gun and two machine guns, providing it with considerable firepower. Do you remember, this was an early World War II tank firepower, such as this was very rare during that period. So let me interrupt today's video to ask you a very important question. Have you ever given a bad Father's Day gift? I know I did when I was a kid. I know now that I am a father, I have many years of bad Father's Day gifts ahead of me. Socks. <laughs> weird bottles of alcohol that I don't want to drink, that sort of stuff. Stuff that gets relegated to the back of the closet, never to be seen again. Well, look, this year, Ridge is making gifting easy with one of their biggest sales of the year for Father's Day. And look, Ridge products make fantastic gifts. This Ridge wallet expands to take 12 cards. I've got three in there because I'm a regular person. <laughs> Not some Elon Musk. Elon Musk probably doesn't even carry a wallet, does he? But look, I'm a regular person. I got three in here. I got my bank cards. I got my ID. Easy. Plus there's room for cash. Just pop that in the little back thing there and it keeps it neatly strapped. And look how thin that is. That's perfect. This is like, I used to have this giant, ugly leather wallet that always had like old receipts and stuff. And it's like, why do you have those? <laughs> Just throw them away. They've got over 30 colors to choose from. This one is the Burnt Titanium. I've got another one here, whoops a daisy, which is carbon fiber. Plus they're all designed with RFID blocking materials that protect you from digital pickpockets. And if you're someone who's always losing their wallet, well, good news, Ridge offers optional AirTag attachments so you never have to lose your wallet again. I don't have that yet, but I'm excited about getting it. I love AirTags. Plus they also have the Ridge key case, which matches the material. This is the carbon fiber one, matches the carbon fiber wallet. And it's like a Swiss army knife for keys. It's fantastic, holds one to six keys. I have four. Plus, you can get up to 30% off your order when buying the Ridge wallet and the key case together, which is nice. Over 3 million customers and 50,000 five-star reviews can't be wrong. And the Ridge team are so confident you'll love it, they'll let you test drive it for 99 days. That's right, you can send it back for a full refund if you don't love it. So this Father's Day, give the gift of Ridge. You'll get 40% off through June 10th by using my link below or just going to ridge.com slash side projects. That again is ridge.com slash side projects. And now back to today's video. Power for this mighty machine came from a Paxman Ricardo V12 diesel engine, which delivered 600 horsepower. However, due to the tank's enormous mass, its top speed was a mere 13.8 kilometers an hour, making it rather slow and difficult to maneuver. Only one TOG 2 was ever produced and it never saw active service and well uh, that's going to become a recurring theme with these weird and ridiculous tanks. It underwent a series of trials before being relegated to a training role. The reasons for its failure were closely tied to its most unique feature, its massive size and weight. This had been intended to make it excel in the type of drawn out trench warfare that characterized World War I. But in World War II, the situation simply never developed, making the TOG too unnecessary. Instead, the focus shifted towards more mobile and versatile tanks that could easily adapt to the diverse terrains and conditions of modern warfare. Beyond this, the TOG 2's slow speed and limited mobility made it an easy target for enemy forces, particularly aircraft and artillery. Its enormous size and weight also presented significant logistical challenges, as transporting it by rail or ship was a difficult and time-consuming process. But the TOG 2 would be far from the only 
stupidly large tank to leave the British drawing boards in World War II, because as the war's conclusion loomed, British planners began looking at Germany's final line of fortifications and wondered if whether a super heavy breakthrough tank might be needed after all, which, well, that moves us rather nicely to our next tank. The A39 Tortoise, like the Tog 2 before it, was big. Measuring approximately 10 meters in length, 3.2 meters in width, and 3 meters in height, it was equally heavy too, reaching an incredible 78 tons. Now, to put that into perspective, the Tortoise was nearly twice as heavy as a more typical World War II tank, such as the American M4 Sherman or the German Panzer IV. It developed during late World War II. Its primary goal was to serve as a heavily armored assault gun that could shake off hits and systematically level German bunkers. Naturally, then, it had lots of armor. Its front armor was an astounding 225 millimeters thick, while its side sides and rear were 102 mm and 51 mm thick respectively. Naturally, it was thicker on the front, as its primary role as a bunker buster meant that it theoretically at least should have never been pointing its rear towards the enemy. Its firepower was exceptional, being equipped with a powerful 94 mm cannon and two machine guns. This would have served it well against enemy tanks, as its impressive armor penetration up to 230 mm was easily enough to handle all enemy tanks of its day, for example the mighty and much venerated German Tiger II only had a maximum armor thickness of 150 millimeters and the Panther was a mere 80. Powering this beast was a Rolls-Royce Meteor petrol engine which delivered 650 horsepower, but like the Tog II before it, the great weight of the machine significantly limited its top speed, which was a mere 6.4 kilometers an hour. Like all of the tanks in today's video, it never saw active service. For the Tortoise, this was because by the time its six prototypes were built and tested, World War I had already come to an end. But it did at least undergo extensive trials, and one prototype was even sent to Germany for evaluation by the British Army of the Rhine, where it did its job of demolishing bunkers and armor very well. Full production of the Tortoise was considered in the early days of the Cold War, but it was not meant to be. It was determined that its slow speed and limited mobility made it an easy target on a real battlefield. Further to this, it was also deemed that there was little need for a heavily armed and armored bunker buster by the time the Cold War, in which mobility and therefore survivability was increasingly deemed far greater importance. Also, like the Tog 2 before it, the sheer size of the Tortoise made it a logistical nightmare. It was far too wide to easily ship by rail, and many bridges just couldn't support its weight. Our next weird tank is the FV4005. This was weird for one reason. Its absolutely enormous 183mm cannon. Designed in the early 1950s, it was a machine with a single purpose, to destroy the latest Soviet heavy tanks such as the IS-3 and T-10. The FV-4005 was an interim tank. The British were absolutely terrified of having to face those new Soviet heavy tanks if the Cold War went hot, and so they needed a tank with a big cannon, and they needed it now. With this in mind, it was built on the chassis of the readily available Centurion tank, one of the most successful British post-war tank designs. The chassis remained unchanged, but the turret on top of it received a total redesign to accommodate the new cannon. This turret was enormous, big enough to have a full-size door in the rear. But don't let the size fool you into thinking that it was well protected, because in reality, it had very thin armor of just 14 millimeters. This thickness was just enough to defeat rifle fire and shrapnel, but it would have been useless against any serious cannon. This thin armor was very intentional, however, as the extreme firepower and range of the FV-4005 meant that it would rarely have come under fire. It was intended to simply sit at great and safe distances, knocking out tanks at its leisure. In testing, the FV-4005 performed like a dream. Its cannon destroyed everything put before it with ease, and the venerable Centurion chassis upon which it was based proved reliable. Yet despite this success, the FV-4005 never entered service. So why? Primarily, this was because big guns were just becoming obsolete. Sure, the FV-4005 was a very effective tank killer, but a new technology had emerged that could do its job at a significantly cheaper cost and in a much more compact package. And this was the anti-tank guided missile. These have a longer range and are more accurate than cannons and can be mounted on a greater variety of vehicles, making them seem like a much more sensible choice for heavy tank hunting. Considering this realization, there was simply no need for the FV-4005, regardless of how well it might have completed its assigned task, and so it was unceremoniously cancelled in 1957. Thank you. 
For our next weird tank, we must wind the clock back to the 1920s, back to that magical time when the standard form of a tank had yet to be finalized, and as a result, all sorts of weird and wacky designs emerged. Where we find this, or we find the independent. Like the TOG-2, the Independent was a breakthrough tank intended to spearhead assaults on heavily fortified enemy positions. So far, this all sounds pretty normal, doesn't it? The same was indeed pretty orthodox. But what made it weird was how it went about achieving that aim. A little design feature that the eagle-eyed amongst you probably already have spotted. Yeah, this thing's got five turrets. These turrets varied in size and each served a specific purpose. Central to the tank sat a large main turret housing a 47mm gun and surrounding it on each corner were four more modestly sized secondary turrets, each housing a 7.7mm machine gun. This configuration allowed the Independent to take on a heavy target such as a tank or bunker with its main cannon and fend off attacking infantry with its machine guns all at the same time. All this firepower naturally made the Independent rather heavy, weighing in at 32 tons. Now, this is nothing compared to some of the tanks that we've already covered, of course, but for the time, it was simply enormous. But surprisingly, the Independent was no slouch, and it was able to reach a top speed of 32 kilometers an hour. Every rose has its thorn, however, and for the Independent, its impressive speed and firepower came at the cost of its armor, which was only 28 millimeters thick at its greatest point. Ultimately, despite its innovative design, the Independent never saw active service. Its multi-turreted configuration, while groundbreaking, presented several challenges that contributed to its ultimate failure. The tank was expensive to produce and maintain, and its numerous moving parts and turrets created a multitude of potential points of failure. Additionally, the complex communication system required for the tank's crew to coordinate the multiple turrets proved unreliable. The Independent also failed because of changing tank philosophies in the interwar period, particularly among the British, where there was a shift to lighter, more mobile tanks. This change in thinking rendered the Independent obsolete, and its sheer size and weight became significant drawbacks. And furthermore, the tank's armor was simply not thick enough to be of any use on the battlefield. But while the Independent was a failure in and of itself, it did at least live on vicariously by inspiring other tank designs, chief among which was the Soviet T-28, which was a key component of the Red Army's armored forces in the 1930s. Soviet engineers found its multi-turret design particularly intriguing and liked the idea of being able to engage multiple targets at the same time, and so the T-28 incorporated this concept into its design, featuring a main turret armed with a 76.2mm gun, along with two smaller turrets equipped with machine guns. The T-28 also went on to actually be mass-produced, making the Independent the one tank of this video that actually went on to have a direct impact on the real world. Now, the tanks we've discussed today so far have certainly been weird, but they've been weird primarily due to their absurdly ambitious scale, having much more armor, significantly greater firepower, and many more turrets than their contemporaries. For our final example, though, let's up the ante a little bit and look at a machine which took the entire concept of what a tank should be and threw it in the bin in favor of a radical new approach. And this is the Praying Mantis. But just what was the praying mantis we hear you cry? Well, let's answer that question with a question. Have you ever found yourself in a tank, keen and eager to blow up your enemies? But gosh darn it, wouldn't you know it? Someone has gone and put a giant wall between you and those enemies. What are you meant to do? Drive around the thing? Such a labor, such a chore. Unacceptable. What you yearn for is some kind of contraption to raise your turret above the wall. But surely such a thing doesn't exist. That would be the preserve of science fiction. Well, well, dream no more, drawn out hypothetical tank crew member, because the guys and gals at the County Commercial Cars Company have you covered with the Praying Mantis, a tank with a turret that could be raised over three meters to shoot over that stupid pesky wall. It was built on the chassis of a Bren gun carrier, a venerable lightly armored utility vehicle from World War II. Very little of the donor vehicle remained, however, as the entire midsection of the vehicle was replaced with a long rectangular elevating section topped with a turret touting two Bren machine guns. This gave it modest but acceptable firepower that could happily deal with infantry and soft targets. It being based on a Bren gun carrier also made it lightweight and mobile with a top speed of approximately 48 kilometers an hour. But despite its innovative design, it never saw active service. Only a single prototype was built and it underwent a limited series of trials. These tests showed the base basic premise to have promise, as it fulfilled its aim of firing over walls perfectly, but they also exposed the glaring issue. It was so top-heavy that it fell over. 
a lot. Compounding this issue was the fact that it was simply too lightly armored. A quick buzz of a German machine gun would have been enough to kill the crew. As a result of these rather glaring flaws, it was deemed unsuitable for deployment and was cancelled in 1944. So. What can we take away from this? For sure, the praying mantis's unique insect-like appearance leaves us with an interesting tank for us to ogle over in the present day, but what more insightful conclusion can we draw from its failure? If nothing else, it serves as a reminder of the importance of experimentation and adaptation in the ever-growing landscape of military technology. It also highlights the challenges of balancing innovation with practicality, showing that even the most unusual and imaginative creations can be held back if its radical features are poorly implemented.